Thank you for your word and the opportunity for salvation. If we'll just but read it and study it and understand it. Help us as we do those things to do our very best to live it in our lives so that we may be examples for those that we come in contact with. Especially next week as many of us are going to camp. Help us to keep this in mind as we try to be examples for the young ones. Thank you for the opportunity. We ask that you bless our week and continue to bless the other weeks at camp. Thank you for Brother Jimmy, bringing him to us tonight and be with him as he teaches from your word. Help us to listen attentively so that we may listen and apply things that he will say tonight from your word into our lives. We ask God that you are with our missionaries overseas. And please grant them success and keep them safe. Thank you for men like Brother Judd, who's dedicated his life to your work in foreign lands, and thank you for his example. Please be with his family and his passing. Please be with our troops and keep them safe. Please be with our nation at this time as we're going through trials and help those in decision-making capacities to make the best decisions for us so that we may come closer to you. Thank you so much, God, for your son Jesus, his willingness to come to earth and die for us, to not only die but to be tortured on our behalf. When we put him on the cross with our sin, please forgive us, God, from our sins help us to learn from our mistakes and do better the next time. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. We welcome you here this evening to Bremen Church of Christ for our midweek Bible study. We are in the midst of our summer series and thank you for your attendance here. Any who are visiting with us this evening, we're especially glad to see you here as our guests at Bremen. We'll dismiss now with a nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Connor's coming right there, James. Our speaker this evening is Brother Jimmy Bradshaw, comes to us from the Tallapoosa congregation. Uh, he and the rest of the Bradshaws are here, boosting our attendance this evening. We're thankful for that. Jimmy has been at the Tallapoosa congregation, I would guess now, for about a year and two weeks, somewhere in there. Uh, came there last May and uh, has become uh, engaged in the church area here in the West Georgia area, and we're certainly thankful for that. We'll be working with us next week at Camp in Agehi, which we're certainly thankful for as well. And we'll be speaking on Tuesday night of camp next week if you want to come hear him there. We're thankful to have Jimmy here as a part of our summer series and look forward to what he has to say this evening. Jimmy. Good evening. Oh, that was weak. I don't know how y'all normally are, but that was pretty weak. I'll, I'll give you another opportunity, though. Uh, equal. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. If you're asleep at the beginning, I've got no chance in the lesson tonight. So it's best to try to uh, keep us awake at the beginning. I do appreciate the opportunity to come here. I appreciate the invitation by Sidney White. Uh, he called me, and, and then about a week or two later, he said, well, I'm not going to be there. I said, well, okay. <laughs> and uh, I know several others that... Uh, I know from Bremen they're not here tonight, but uh, uh, I'm glad that all of you are here. It, uh, it's not quite like coming to some congregations when I come here. Uh, it's, of course, the first time I've spoken here, but I know so many here. And uh, camp, I tell you, camp in the gay. How many are going to camp? Oh, good, good, good. 
Looking forward to it. I guarantee my sermon next Tuesday will likely be a hotter sermon. And so it will be much more cooler uh, tonight. Um, I did bring my family, and so we're excited about being here. We don't get to visit around much during church time, so this is kind of a treat for us. We have looked forward to it. Sidney said to basically, by the way, I did appreciate, uh, he called me a younger preacher, which I did appreciate that. I'm getting the age now, I just had a birthday, and I'm getting the age now when I don't know that I'm in that younger category. I'm kind of transitioning, you know, so I do. Anytime someone calls me younger now, I, I take it as a compliment. But he said, preach on something, your favorite sermon. Well, that's, that's not always easy to do because, you know, it's, you're like, well, what sermon is that? So. And sometimes what the preacher considers his favorite isn't the sermon that sometimes the audience likes the most. So I tried to go with one and actually took some bits of, from another one. But I think a lesson that will do us all good tonight, how to trust God. You may think, well, that seems a little oversimplistic, but uh, it seems like something we all need to do. But uh, I think there are times in our lives, even the, the ones of us that maybe grew up going to church all our lives and have been doing it for decades now, there are times when we need to go back and learn how to trust God once again. We start drifting away. We start getting consumed by this or that. And we no longer fully trust in God and do as He would desire us to do. I want to tell you, you know, sometimes we trust in people and they let us down. <laughs> Don't mean to. You know, when you're younger, uh, you know, when I was a, a young kid, my dad was my hero. Now, he's still my hero, but when I was a, a young child, to me, my dad could do no wrong. There was nothing my dad couldn't do. I remember one time we went on vacation. We went to Branson, Missouri, and uh, we was going to camp out, camp out in tents, do it the, the real way, you know, camp out in tents, and we got his campsite, and, and I knew my dad. My dad was the expert. Uh, he, he was an Eagle Scout. By the way, I understand that you're not supposed to say it that way. He is an Eagle Scout. My understanding is once you're an Eagle Scout, you're always an Eagle Scout. So he was an expert. And so we went camping, and my dad being the expert, we knew that he knew how to do everything. And that night, our first night there, uh, we had breakfast. Something about on a campfire, uh, uh, bacon on a cast iron griddle or some type, you know, pan. And it all just smells great. And it was a good supper. And so we go to sleep that night. And my dad, I guess a little rusty, he had left the skillet out. And it had all those bacon drippings, that bacon fat left in it. Well, my mom, she's a light sleeper. And so in the middle of the night, she hears something. And she wakes my dad up and says, go check, see what it is. And so he unzips the tent and looks. And lo and behold, there's a skunk just a few feet away from him on our table there, picnic table. Well, my mom's a little outraged. Now, you have to know my mom. She's this southern belle, and she's like, oh my, we have a, a skunk. Everybody else is going to think something's wrong with our campsite, that we have a skunk in ours, and no one else has one. Go get rid of it. And she said it a little emphatically to my dad. So my dad, you know, he got woke up. I, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. In his brilliance, he sees a rock about the size of a baseball right outside the tent. And he says in his brilliant mind as it's working at about 2 in the morning, he says, I'm going to take this rock and I'm going to try to scare the skunk. Those are words you don't really want to put together. Scare a skunk. They don't go well. And so he takes back. Now, bear in mind that my dad was a good, was a good baseball player and he was young, younger then and, and he rears back, th played baseball in college. And uh, uh, anyway, he rears back, takes that, and he throws it, and instead of just going near it and scaring it, he hits it right on the back of the head. He hits it so hard the thing flips and flips off the table and lands. And he looks. It's not moving. He waits five minutes, ten minutes. It's still not moving. Well, now my mom's about had it now. She's like, you're going to have to go get rid of that thing. People are going to think it ate our food and it died from eating our food. You're going to have to get rid of it. So he, he gets out of the tent and he gets up close to it. He has a trash bag in hand. He's going to put it in trash, put it up inside the trash can. Well, he gets about two feet from it. The thing wasn't dead. 
It just got knocked out. It gets up, and it's a little droggy at first, and then it kind of shakes its head, and it turns around, and it sprays everything in a circular pattern, including my dad. Well, me and my brother, we were in a different tent. I was about 11 or 12, and uh, my brother two years older than me. And so about 2.30 in the night, my dad unzips our tent and comes in there, and I'll always remember his words. He said, Boys, what are we going to do? And to me, that was the funniest thing in the world because here we are, about 11 and 13 years old, and a grown man's asking us what we're going to do. And I'm thinking, what well, Nadare said it, well, I'm thinking, well, the first thing I'm going to do is stand up wind from you because you smell a little bit right now. But, you know, you, you, you find out that sometimes people that you think are perfect aren't perfect. Now, they're good, but well, I want to tell you, there is somebody that we can trust. Look there, that worked. Wonderful. And, and so, what do you do? You know, people let you down, and what do you do? There are times that you're going to be in financial despair and, and in trouble, and what do you do? There are times when your faith is going to falter. What do you do? There's times that someone that you love dearly is going to pass away. What do you do? There's times that, that people that you trust will mislead you. What do you do? There's times in the church that, that people will leave, that people will do this, people will do that. There will be problems. What do you do? And I will tell you what you do. You trust in God and you serve Him. You do what the Scriptures say and I guarantee that it's always going to work out. You may have bumpy ride from time to time, but things will work accordingly. The church will grow if we simply decide that we're going to trust in Him and do what God desires us to do. I want to tell you, see, you know, we mess up. We let people down. My dad kind of let us down. We wound up spending the rest of the time in a hotel. And he, after several tomato baths, was able to stay with us. But I want to tell you, God, you know, God, God never lets us down. If he says it, it's going to happen. We never need to doubt it. In Hebrews 6, verses 17 and 19, it says, Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability, that means that he doesn't change, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. We can stand firm in the promises of God. We can know that they're true. It's an anchor for our hope. By the way, hope, I like to define certain terms. And, and hope, a simple definition of hope, is simply the expectation of good. In, in a religious context, in our context, as we're reading this, it's an expectation of good that is an expectation of one day going to heaven with God the Father and Christ our Savior. That's our hope that we have. And we can rest assured that these things will happen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And I want to tell you, this is a, a thing that we can live by and we should live by. But far too often, we, we like to do like the picture here. We like to peek. We don't quite trust God enough to just simply walk the way he tells us. We want to see the way we go. I've seen churches fail to grow because simply they'll say things like, we don't have the money to do that. Uh, we just don't have the resources. Or we don't have enough talent to do this. And on and on, we make excuses. And what we should do is walk by faith. God will provide everything that we need. What is faith? The great definition of faith in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, 1, the English standard says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's being sure of things that we can't see. But it's based on a conviction of the evidence, not just simple evidence, but we've been convicted of things that we know are true. And that is our faith. Before we get into our lesson text tonight, we need to understand that Jesus, while on this earth, he taught his disciples to trust God. 
And many times they really didn't understand what that fully meant. In Mark 9, 31, it says, For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. This must have been troubling to them. How could it be the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is to be king, will be killed and rise the third day? And yet as they go through it, they would even, some of them would, would doubt and their faith would waver. But ultimately as they would look back to this, it would create in them an even stronger faith because they knew that Jesus trusted in God. He had told them exactly what must happen and they understood that they too must trust in God. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 14 and we get to our lesson text. Matthew 14, we'll begin verse 22. A passage that I dare say most of us are familiar with. We're going to see Jesus walking on water tonight. And most of the time I have heard sermons and many of the sermons I have done myself have been from the perspective of Peter. You know, I've heard sermons quite often titled, uh, you know, if you, if you want to walk water, you've got to get out of the boat. And I've heard it from Peter's perspective, and I've heard it from the disciples' perspective, how they liked faith. But I want us tonight, we're going to look at it from Jesus' perspective, what the Lord did. And I think we'll be enriched, I hope, from looking at it from the, those eyes. In verse 22 it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening had come, he was alone there. Now the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the same water, on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked out on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why would you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Like I say, a text that I dare say most of us are familiar with, but let's look at it from the perspective of Jesus. And our overall theme, how to trust God. I want to tell you, to trust God, we must focus on the care of God. God gives a lot to us. In Matthew 14, 22, it said, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. And the Greek there, the word there means to necessitate, to compel, to drive to, to constrain. They didn't have an option. We've got to look in context to see what was going on. Jesus had just miraculously fed the 5,000 men, not counting men and, uh, uh, women and children. What a miracle that was. And we're told in John's account that many there wanted to make him king. The disciples would have been all for that. They knew him to be the Messiah by this point, and, and that's what he was going to be, the Messiah, the king. They wanted him to set up as an earthly king, but that wasn't Christ's purpose in coming to this earth. And so he goes by himself, puts him on the boat to go away, and they must be a little troubled by this. This doesn't fit into what they thought it would be like. This had to be a little bit of a letdown. Here he does this great miracle, and then he doesn't let us do what we should do. I want to tell you that trials that we face, they lead us to maturity. One of my favorite passages comes from James. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, 
lacking nothing. How is it we can have joy? Now, I think some of the times, the reason we, we don't understand some of these things is we equate joy to happiness. But joy is not the same as happiness. See, happiness is based on external circumstances. If things are good, we're going to be happy. But if we have a loss of a loved one, a death in our family, we're going to be sad. And that's okay. The Bible talks about rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. But see, joy, we should be able to maintain joy all the time. What is joy? Joy is the emotion caused by the expectation of good. Now, you may have heard earlier I said hope was the expectation of good. Well, joy is simply that emotion caused by that. So for a Christian, the hope of eternal life, we can maintain our joy as Christians because we always have that hope before us. And that emotion should always be there for us. What joy it will be one day for all of us. But notice that we're going to face trials, and these trials produce patience. Without trials in our lives, without troubles in our lives, None of us would have patience. We need this to grow, to mature. In fact, he says, but let patience have its perfect work. That word teleos there, it means a, a maturity to its completion. And there it says that you may be perfect and complete. He's not using the same words there. The first word is this maturity to its completion. The second word means a completion in its entirety. Well, for example, when a baby is born, one of the first things they do is they count the number of fingers and toes. If you go to Walmart tonight and get a, a dozen eggs, a carton of eggs, and you open it up, because you're going to open it up, you always do that, make sure there's nothing, you know, none of them crack, and you look in there, and they all look good, but you only have 11 eggs. Instead of 12, there's an empty slot there. Are you going to get that carton? It's not complete, is it? You're going to put it back and get one that is complete. And so this is what he's saying. Basically, we can lack nothing through the trials that we get as Christians. We grow to maturity. When we face trials, we still have some maturing that we can do. And I want to tell you, we can do this really till the day we die. But we're never the Christian we need to be until we face some struggles. Who do you go to when you have a boo-boo? Don't you love words like that? Who came up with that word, boo-boo? And yet, I guarantee everyone knows what that word is, do you not? And your kid that has a boo-boo, I guarantee you, we line up all the kids here. I don't know how many you'd have, but you have a good number of them. And, and they have a boo-boo, and you ask them, okay, who are you going to go to first? Almost all of them are going to say, I'm going to go to Mama. Are they not? Mama's the one that deals with boo-boos. Mama has special medicine in her kisses. They kiss boo-boos. Uh, grandmamas do too as well. But, you know, they kiss boo-boos and they're all better. And they put a Band-Aid on it. Dads can't do it right. We're just not good at it. We're not good boo-boos. But, you know, what about when we have troubles in life? What about when we have struggles? What about when we're down? What about when we need something? Who do we turn to? Well, I turn to my wife. Or I turn to, you know, my friends. Or I turn to maybe I, you know, that... You know, chocolate cake's awful good, you know, when I'm having adversity or, or whatever it may be. But I want to tell you what you really should turn to is turn to God. God's the one that really can do anything about whatever your troubles are. Paul writes in the introduction to 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We learn from the comfort of God that we face from being able to go to God in prayer and the good things He gives us. And we learn from this and are able to comfort others. Jesus went to them on the water. In Mark 6, in Mark's account, 6 and 48, He says, Then He saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Straining the new King James. King James says toiling. The American standard says distressed. The English standard, I like what it says. It says painfully rowing. The word, actually one of its uses would be that when if someone was being tortured, 
This is the word in the Greek that you would use. They were at difficulty. They were struggling. And these were people that knew about being on the sea, but, but the Sea of Galilee could be treacherous. And here they were in the middle of it, and they were struggling, and Jesus sees them. And he walks on the water to go to them. Now it was about the fourth watch, or anywhere between 3 and 6 a.m. It was dark. And they were in trouble. And Jesus goes to them. The Sea of Galilee was a large lake. Not technically a sea, but well, here we see, and they were going from Bethsaida to Gennesaret. And they were right in the middle of it. And John 6, 19, it says, So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, and drawn near the boat, they were afraid. Now I want us to think about this. Jesus had miraculous abilities while on this earth. And there's a lot of things that he could do. And think about this. He sees them in distress. He could have somehow teleported right where they was at. I want to tell you another option. He could have flew there. Nothing would be beyond what Christ could have done. He could have just made them safe there. But instead, he walked on the water. Present active means continuous. He continually walked on the water three or four miles. Now I want to tell you, a person walking briskly walks about four to six miles an hour. Jesus sees him in trouble, takes off walking on the water briskly, continuously, for about an hour until he gets to them. There was nothing that was going to keep them from him while they's in trouble. And I want to tell you, we need to understand that there is nothing that keeps Jesus from us in our time of need. And we should, by faith, know that it's true. Romans 8, 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? We know that none of these things do. Nothing can keep him from us. Another thing, to learn to trust a God, we must be willing to cry out to the Lord. Now, this means that we consider ourselves utterly helpless in a situation, and only God can take care of us. But I want to tell you, we've got to get there if we're going to trust in God. Romans 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. By the way, we're not talking about the groanings of the Spirit. We're talking about our groanings as verse 8 and 23 uh, makes that clear. But have you ever had moments, maybe the death of a loved one, where you don't know what to say? And you see someone and you want to say just the right words and basically you break down and all you can do is cry. You ever been there? I think we all have. If not, you will one day. Sometimes we pray to God and we, we're just so troubled we don't even know what to say. That's okay. God knows what's in our hearts. He knows what we're trying to convey. We need to turn things over to Him. The disciples came lost in fear, did they not? They said, it's a ghost. Now, if you have a King James Version, and I'm just going to, it's kind of a side note, but King James there says it's a spirit. Am I correct? I believe I am. It says it's a spirit. The Greek word there is phantasma. Now, the word that we normally think of for spirit is pneuma. Uh, there's nothing wrong there. Uh, it just, you know, words change meaning slightly over time. And at the time the King James was written, the word for uh, phantasma, they would have thought more of it as spirit. For example, we see here they translate it, it's a spirit. Well, clearly they're talking about what we would say is a ghost. It's a ghost is what they meant. And yet there are other times in the King James where you see Holy Ghost, for example. And we say, well, you know, that's better Holy Spirit. But those words have simply crisscrossed over time. What ghost meant to them is what spirit means to us now. But here we see, they say it's a ghost. They were scared. I don't know if they believed in ghosts or not, but that's what they thought they must have saw. 
It's not normal. By the way, you know, I don't know when's the last time you saw out in the middle of a lake <laughs> the wind's going crazy and you see someone walking on the water. That is an unusual occurrence. I will grant them that. But they said it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. Ekradzin in the Greek. And I love this word. It literally means to croak like a raven. Ever heard of a raven croak? How about a crow? It's loud, isn't it? They weren't quiet about it. They were screaming like girls, you might say. You know, the way people do down a roller coaster. They were afraid for their life. They had lost control. And it said that Jesus would actually walk past them, but he heard this crying out, and that's why he stops, according to Mark 6 and 48. Later we see that Peter actually gets out and walks on the water, but he sees this tempestuous sea, and he loses his faith for a moment, and he begins to drown. And he cries out, he croaks like a raven too, Lord, save me. There's a song that I love we're all familiar with. What a friend we have in Jesus. A line that goes, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Isn't that a good picture there? If you look closely, you might see some things a little off on the picture, though. And um, probably good. Haley's not here, to be honest. Um, you know, you try to serve God and do things that are always right. And there's almost a certain, you think, well, things are always going to work out good. And they do in the long run. But sometimes we face adversity. We were at a marriage enrichments class at where I was preaching at in North Carolina on Saturday night. And Haley went to change Sophie's diaper. Sophie was eight weeks old at the time. And on Sophie's body, she saw all these, what the, I guess the medical people called nodules around her body. And there was actually a nurse that was at church that night, and Haley showed it to the nurse, and the nurse looks at it, she, she didn't really know what it was. She said, said I, I probably need to call you a pediatrician. We called a pediatrician, and they were these, they were kind of bruised colored. They were kind of a greenish brown blue like color. And uh, they had something inside of them. It was uh, kind of odd. We called the pediatrician. They said, well, it's not red, so it's most likely nothing infectious, so just bring her in Monday. We bring her in Monday, and the pediatrician still didn't have a clue. In fact, took pictures of, of Sophie's body because it, it was something that they had never seen. said, I think you need to go to a, a dermatologist and see what the dermatologist says. Well, the dermatologist comes in and looks at Sophie and, he says, well, you know, that's never good. One doctor does that. You know, well, it could be one of a hundred things, some good, some bad. He said, uh, really, the only way you're going to know is to do a biopsy. And I'm not equipped to do a biopsy on an eight-week-old infant. He said, you're going to need to go to a pediatric surgeon. Well, this is getting scary, but we still don't think it's anything big, you know, that it's nothing important. We go the next day, next morning, to the pediatric surgeon. And the pediatric surgeon comes in, looks at it, and he had a little bit different look than the others, by the way. It's like maybe he'd seen it before, but he goes, well, he said, we need to do a um, full body x-ray. We need to do a uh, MRI on all the organs and they all, named off all these tests. I'm thinking, well, we need a, uh, you know, we need a biopsy is what we need. We don't need all that other stuff. And so he's going all these other things, and he said, he said, I'll tell you what, his office was right next door to the children's hospital there and he said go do it and then uh, and then this afternoon come back and I should have the results back so we go do it we still don't think nothing of it you know baby goes through Sophie went through and all this we thought so little of it that Isabella we had at a babysitter's that day and we picked her up that afternoon James Taylor had been in school that morning we picked him up and took him with us so here we are one big family and we go to see this pediatric surgeon, see what he has to say, thinking, you know, it's no big deal. We go to a waiting room. Surgeon comes in. He looks, he says, Sophie has a tumor. 
And, and I want to tell you, he was amazing the way he dealt with people. You can tell he wasn't the first time he'd ever told anyone this. He stops. Well, you know, that wasn't quite what we expected. You know, we wouldn't expect anything big. And he says this, and our hearts begin to sink. And, and about the time we're about ready to, you know, we're finally ready to process, we're ready to start answering questions, then he goes and he lays the next one on us. I'm 95% certain it's cancer. We need to admit her tonight. <laughs> you lose control then. What do you mean? How can this happen to us? And then children, you got to give them. They, they ask the questions that you don't want to ask, <laughs> even think about. And so James Taylor in there with us, bless his heart, he looks at me and says, Daddy, is this something Sophie could die from? And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how strong your faith are in moments like this you realize you utterly have no control over the situation there's nothing you can do you have no expertise in this you completely are trust in the hands of the surgeon the nurses the medical treatment but I want to tell you more so what we came to the conclusion and what pulled us through whatever we was going to have is we decided we was going to trust in God whatever the outcome God cares for us. And even if the worst had happened, we knew that we would make it through, that God would love us, that somehow, some way, it would work. It came out that prayers were answered, even though everybody was sure, and they still not sure why it wasn't. They wound up having to take a walnut-sized tumor out. It wasn't cancer. And we were thankful. Prayers were answered. Well, it wasn't a miracle, but through God's providence, He chose not to make us go down that route. We must learn to give our cares to God and let Him work. Jesus, before He leaves His disciples in John 14 and verse 3, says, Let not, for one, says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, and believe also in me. We see there's a certain component there because we do truly got to get to times where we truly understand there's nothing we can do about some things. It's in God's hands. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Some translations say anxiety is there. Literally it's your distracting cares. You know, there are things that we can take care of. And if there's something you can do, you need to do, you need to do it. But there are other things that there's nothing we can do about. Don't dwell on those things. Cast them away. Throw them out. And give them over to the one that can. That's God. He cares for you. He sent His Son to die for you. We see that Jesus took over with Peter. Peter croaked like a raven. And you notice though something, a little nuance there. Peter cries out, Lord, save me. But Peter is not the one that reached out for Jesus. Read it closely. It's Jesus who stretched out his hand and took hold of Peter. Peter's trust was in Jesus. In our closing moments, let's look at some things from Hebrews. Just to show how much Jesus and God does care and how much that Jesus does indeed know about us. In Hebrews 2.9, the Hebrew writer there says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Jesus was made lower than angels. He was made flesh and blood that he might suffer on the cross. He knows what it's like to be flesh and blood. He knows what it's like to be human. We see in Hebrews 2, 18, it says, For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. It says, has suffered. 
There it's the perfect active indicative, the perfect tense. And I don't expect any of you to remember this, but what's important about this passage is it means something of a definite point in time that has an ongoing effect. And so here where it says he has suffered, it has remained a part of his permanent memory. He will forever know what it's like to suffer because of what he did for us. He will forever know what it's like to be tempted. So whatever you're going through, Christ has been there. He knows everything that you're going through. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, it says, Therefore he is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him, since he always lives, continuous, to make intercession for them. Those that want to come to Christ, he's going to always live forever and ever to make intercession for you. It even goes beyond this. In Hebrews 9, verse 24, I love the American Standard account of this. It says, For Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, like in pattern to the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us. You know, there's a lot of passages that talk about Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. And there's even a passage, you know, when Stephen was being stoned to death, where it says that Jesus was standing on the right hand of God. But think about this, if we're trying to serve God, if we're trying to be faithful, Jesus literally is before the face of God pleading on our account. Don't you think that's effective on our behalf? Isn't that wonderful what he does for us? He knows. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Why should we ever worry about anything this life brings to us? The Lord is our helper. Man can do nothing to us. If we would but serve him, we can be assured of eternal life. There's a song, I don't know if it's in your songbook, but do you know my Jesus? And I think it's fitting that as we close out our class tonight that we look at the words of this song, which I think so adequately express things. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Who knows your disappointments? Who hears each time you cry? Who understands your heartaches? Who dries the tears from your eyes? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you? And that he will abide to the end. I appreciate you having me here this evening. And I hope there's been something beneficial you've heard. But I think we'll all agree that if we'll just trust in God and serve him, that there's nothing this world can ever throw at us that will remove us from our hope and from the promise of God that one day we'll have eternal life. Thank you very much.